My name is Josh Miller. I own Riverstone Kennels, and I've been training gun dogs for more than 16 years. I have field trialed, I've hunt tested, but at the end of the day, I'm a duck hunter. You might find that the duck in our Duck Dogs podcast is spelt uniquely. The UK stands for my British labs. I love my British labs. I love what they offer me, both as a part of my family and the high motor in the field. As you're going to find, I have some pretty special dogs. Follow along in our podcast series here as we talk about both in the field hunting and in the field training situations that will hopefully help you progress with your dog at home. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode. Uh, this is the first time that we have ever done a co-branded uh, podcast episode, and you're going to understand why here in just a minute. So this is going to be kind of a co-branded uh, Duck Dogs and Retriever Roadmap podcast episode. And before I do that, let me make sure that we thank our Duck Dog sponsors. So thank you to Yukonuba. Yukonuba Premium Performance Sport 3020 is the blend of food that I have my dogs on right now at the kennel. And I would highly recommend if you're looking for a premium option to put your four-legged hunting partner on, you go check out the Yukonuba line. 3020 is the blend that I'm feeding, and the results, uh, they speak for themselves. So www.yukonuba.com. Also, thank you to Gundog Supply. Gundog Supply is your one-stop shop for all of your hunting and training needs, and we are in the thick of training season. So make sure that you get all the supplies that you are going to need to finish off this training season and head into the fall strong, www.gundogsupply.com. They're great people, great products, and just an absolutely fantastic company. Thank you to Kent Cartridge. Kent Cartridge is our shotgun shell of choice all hunting season long, but then during the training season, we switched to the Kent Poppers, or I'm sorry, the Blanks, rather. Uh, the, the Kent Blanks are a great option if you're wanting to simulate that shotgun blast, the noise, but not have the danger of the actual projectile. So a great training tool, www.kentcartridge.com. Also, thank you to Lucky Duck. Lucky Duck is your five-star crash test ready kennel, both in the intermediate and in the large size. So no matter how big or small your hunting partner is, you can make sure that they're traveling the safest way that they possibly can. They also have the fan to keep your pup cool in this warm training season. So go check out Lucky Duck the kennel, the fan, the cot, everything that you need, www.luckyduck.com. Thank you to Sitka Gear. Sitka Gear is your premium option for all of your outdoor clothing, whether it is for hunting season or your everyday wear. I promise you they have some fantastic everyday wear for training that will keep you in the field longer. doesn't matter if it's in the rain, in the cold, in the heat. www.sitkagear.com has you covered. And last but not least, thank you to Retriever Roadmap. Retriever Roadmap is your premium option, as all the Retriever Roadmap podcast listeners on this episode know. Your premium option for online training to train your dog at home. A video library that will walk you through step-by-step and get you from where you are to your goal. www.retrieverroadmap.com Well, I hope everyone is off to a uh, a great start to their week here. Uh, We have uh, a big week. We had a big weekend, and we're going to tell you about it. But uh, before I do that, uh, I want to kind of dig into why this is a co-branded episode here today, and it has everything to do with the guest that I have with me uh, sitting at my table right now. So uh, if you were a part of the Retriever Roadmap Strike Force training uh, weekend, you know who this is. And, and if you don't, uh, I'm going to introduce him right now. It is uh, my good friend, Lewis, uh, who is over from, uh, from Scotland. And he is spending some time here with us uh, training and uh, doing our dog stuff. And he was a part of the Retriever Roadmap Strike Force event. So, Lewis, thank you for being here. And uh, take a second to introduce yourself. I've asked Lewis to talk as slow as possible <laughs> so, so uh, we can understand him. But, Lewis, take it away. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Big bit travelled from across the pond, and the weather's a bit warmer here. But yeah, it's great to be over. Great to see the new dogs, and uh, just try and help everyone out with their training. It's been great. Yeah, it was it was definitely a fun event. So kind of a quick little background here is, uh, Lewis and I have become uh, extremely good friends. Uh, we, I think it's pretty fair to say that we we speak almost daily. 
Mm-hmm. You know, very much, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. And uh, and it's it's been fun to have not only the friendship that we have from as long a distance as we are, but obviously the dogs are what kind of you know brought us together in the first place. And you know, a lot of a lot of the dogs that uh, that I you know have at my house right now, you know, Lewis has had some sort of uh, connection one way or another, you know, with them. So uh, it's always been kind of a fun a fun deal, a fun relationship with uh, with he and I. And uh, if you guys don't know, if you're a Duck Dog listener and you, you're not quite sure what I'm talking about with uh, the Retriever Roadmap Strike Force event, so through Retriever Roadmap, we have what we call Strike Teams, and Strike stands for Sharing Training Retrievers in Keen Excellence. So that's what the acronym there. Uh, but these Strike Teams are all over the country. We have them all over the place, and they've been probably the the best and highly raved about part of the program. Everybody seems to really love that option or love the uh, the training, the group aspect of it and seeing other trainers and other dogs. And I wanted to get a group event where everybody could come. And so we had, do you remember, Lewis? It was like, it was over 100 people to show up. I think it was like 20 states and three countries or... Yeah, so. not including me as well. Yeah, not, yeah. right. <laughs> but that might be including you. Yeah, the, the, including me, yeah. Uh, right, uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was a really interesting um, you know deal because you know there are a lot of of hurdles that I think came from prepping and planning, which Lewis and I here did uh, together to kind of make this event possible. But um, what we did is we came together and we we trained, and all these people brought their dogs and uh, all sorts of levels and all sorts of people and all sorts of application as they come from different areas of the country, and it was really a fun thing and. The number one thing that stood out to me was, was the people. You know, we didn't have any sour grapes. We didn't have any bad people. We didn't have any, you know, there's usually the one person. And that one person that just is a complete pain that kind of takes the fun out of it for people. We didn't have that. And that's, that's one of the things that really stood out to me. And as I'm getting emails and text messages and Instagram messages about how everybody loved this event, everybody's talking about the people. And so the people is kind of what stood out, you know, to me on that. Definitely, yeah. It was good. It was actually very interesting to see the different levels of training and how the dogs worked, and especially the different variety of dogs. Uh, we had a few American labs there, uh, mostly British labs, but it was great to see the different levels of training. Um, and it's hard as well to set up different retrieves, different tests, just test everyone. But I think we did quite a good job. The heat didn't help me right enough, but... Yeah, <laughs> the, the, um, the heat that first day was rough. Yeah, it was toasty-like, but um, I think the dogs did very well. They were all very nice standards. Um, a lot of people had a lot of things to work on, but that's just dog training. Yeah, and so I, I think as I look back on the, the planning stage of this, so we had we split everybody into three different groups. Uh, we had a puppy group, we had an intermediate level group, and then we had an advanced group. And... We had it set up to where everybody could watch the other groups, which I thought was really beneficial because, let's be real, we're not making progress with dogs in two days, but if we can train the people, that helps them then go home and make the progress you know, on their own or at least keep the momentum going that we started with or got going at the event. And you know, that was probably the most difficult you know, piece of it for me anyway, was how do you set up you know, these sets for, okay, we have, yeah, I think we had, if I'm remembering right, we had like 30, you know, some puppies. I think we had like 38 or something like that, intermediate. And then we had like 28 or something like that, advanced. Like It was a, a pretty even mixture across the board, but even in the advanced, you know, we had very advanced to maybe just kind of starting into that advanced, you know, handling stage. Or we had, you know, puppies. We had everything from... You know, dogs who were steady and run really, really nice marks, which a couple, you know, dogs stand out. And then we had pups that are really young and had never done anything more than just a hand toss throw. So that was the most difficult thing for me was how do you incorporate, you know, things for everybody where everybody can participate. But uh, but I also think we did a really good job. Yeah, send that up. I, I did something quite unusual in the novice, which is quite unusual here. Um, we did a kind of British-style walked-up version. A um, couple of marks, couple of blinds, but all four dogs had to honour the dog that was retrieving. So it was quite quite interesting to see some of the dogs that hadn't had a lot of heel work done. Um, probably the biggest thing I would say of all the dogs was just obedience, the lack of obedience, um, especially honouring with heel work and things like that. But the dogs did get it in the second day. They were picking it up nice, but it was maybe something to work on, especially for a shooting environment. But 
the advanced dogs were very good. I thought they were really, really smart. Some of the dogs. Um, we did the same the second day. I did a two dog walk up in the open, just to make it a bit more tricky. Um, but again, they did very well. A lot of dogs did really good. Some not so good, but still things to work on. Yeah, I, I think um, you know as we really look at the the dogs and and watching them run. It was interesting, I think, when people were asking our feedback as far as, hey, what do, you, what do I need to work on? I think a lot of times people were thinking, hey, you need to work on lining, or hey, you need to work on casting, or hey, you know, like thinking of like these nuggets. And so much of it came back to obedience is really what, yeah. what people needed. An old saying is it all starts at the heel. That's kind of number one thing. If the dog isn't lining at your heel or it's trying to turn away from you, things like that, it just makes things so much e- uh, so much harder. If you can get your dog lining good off your heel straight away and it's steady at heel and it's tight, it makes things a lot easier for the long run. But I think a lot of people picked that up, especially with the walked up. Um, they could see their dog, especially with the pressure of the other dogs, that they were kind of struggling a bit with the heel work. But just something good for them to work on. Well, and, and one thing that Luce and I were talking about here oh, just maybe 15, 20 minutes ago before we started this thing is uh, we, we both have a... Uh, pretty major frustration with social media. Fair to say? Yeah, definitely. 100%. It, it's it's the worst, in my opinion anyway, it's the worst thing that has happened to dogs, at least in our little community, because we, we're getting, you know, people that are overnight, you know, trainers and breeders, which is not good for the for the breed, right, or for the quality of dog. Um, but people see that, oh, I think that's a cool job. I'm just going to you know, start doing that. Uh, we have we have people that are you know contacting. I really want to talk about this here you know a little later on, but um, contacting you know people like yourself, just trying to import anything that they possibly can. Trying to get anything. Don't they don't look at quality. They're just looking at the dog, how they can send the dog over, how much it costs. They don't really care about the dog breeding. They don't know any factors behind it. Um, it can, can be quite frustrating at times. Yeah, and and so, uh, but I think going back to the reason I bring that up. I think the the lack of obedience, I think, is a big part of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Everybody yeah. wants to show the the fun and the sex the sexy part, right? Like mm-hmm. the the big retrieves and the big water entry and all stuff. And it's like you can't you can't have anything of true substance without the obedience. And it's quite frankly, the obedience is the biggest part. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's all show. And even even most of the dogs that um, they're not only just shooting dogs, they're also house pets and. Obedience is a big part of that as well, um, especially if you're wanting the big entries, the big showing off. People skip it, and that's the most important, especially for in the house. Like obedience in the house, it's it's a, one of the biggest factors. Probably over in Scotland, that's one of my biggest um, things for taking dogs in is obedience. He works sit and stay, and it's so straightforward. But everyone misses it. They're wanting to do the big retrieves over fences, over water, everything like that, and try and run before they can walk. And it shows later down the line. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely the same thing here because everybody wants to f- fly through that thing. We see it even at the kennel. You know, we have when dogs come in, especially for that intermediate program. I mean, that first half minimum of that program is extremely obedient heavy, both on lead and off lead. But it's it's obedient heavy, and I think at times there are people that get a little antsy, going like, like, are are we going to do anything else? It's like. We can't do anything else unless this is extremely proficient and people want to fly through that part of it. Yeah, you build the house from the foundations up. If you've not got that there, then you're you're really setting yourself up for a fall down the line, especially when it comes to group training, um, big big kind of group uh, retrieves and things like that, and you can really cause problems down the line. And plus it's harder to sort when they're older. When the dog hits a year, year and a half, and it's not properly walking to heel, things like that, it just gets more and more difficult. Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> so, um, tell me, tell me about the event. So, this was your first time. So, you know, I guess you now that the cat's out of the bag, let's talk about it. Um, Lewis is uh, now officially a part of Retriever Roadmap, and uh, he has his own uh, videos that he has that he's putting into the program, which is going to be a very different flair. So, the whole premise around the Retriever Roadmap and why I landed on that name for this program is because the idea of we're all trying to get to say the same destination, but we're all going to take different routes to get there. Right. So like, you know, I may take the interstate, Lewis may take you know, the back roads and someone may take somewhere in the middle. A lot of this has to do with your dog's strengths and weaknesses, your strengths and weaknesses as an owner, as a handler, 
what kind of uh, environment you have, what what obstacles do you have in front of you, you know, what uh, environment do you have to train in. There's so many factors to this that there just simply cannot be a step one, two, three, A, B, C, do this on day one, this on day two. It can't happen. Like there are too many variables you know, as a part of this. So uh, that's the whole premise around the roadmap. So bringing Lewis in for me was adding even more options or more routes that you could take on this road. And so uh, one of the things, oh, so when, when we, so we've been working on this for a long time, yeah. you know, probably, I, I think it's probably been eight or 10 months when mm. we first you know, started this. And, you know, one of the first things that, you know, Lewis had told me when he watched my stuff, he's like, man, like we, we just do some of this stuff so differently, you know? And for me, I was like, that's, that's the best part of this, right? Like I want us to, to show things because we're striving for the same thing. That's one of the reasons that Lewis and I, I think our friendship started off so strongly right away is because we're very like-minded in the level that we want our dogs. Like we all, we both expect uh, a very high level of control and a very high level of performance but then we also have our dogs as a big part of our family. So we also have to have the off switch, the, the control, the, the temperament, everything else we're looking for. And, but we're, we do things very differently, you know, with the, with the tools that we use and the approaches. And so with Lewis involved in the program, if I have, you know, if one of my ways isn't working for you, well, Lewis is going to have a couple ways of his way, you know, to try. And I think it's really going to help people be more successful as you go through this. Plus, I think that there's a lot of value too for people out there that are looking for more of a um, you know, like an authentic overseas type of a training method, and like that's it. You know, I, I feel like I um, I try to incorporate some of that into you know, my training, but at the same side, like Lewis is very authentic, obviously, in doing that. So, um, so Lewis, first off, what was your first off shooting the videos for the program and kind of getting into you know, what what was your impression of that process so i actually thought that video would be quite straightforward and quite easy um <laughs> completely wrong <laughs> um make it look you josh makes it look very easy but it's actually very very difficult between dogs not behaving which is fine um and the horrendous scottish weather trying to trying to video <laughs> outside um it's been very very difficult and the time it takes to video one video um, all the different outtakes, all the problems, and between like wind picking up at the wrong time and dogs doing things wrong, it's incredible how long it takes. But again, it's just a completely, I train completely different to um, everyone else. We do a lot of clicker based, uh, treat based, uh, reward based training, um, which I think you get a better dog at the end of it. So the next couple of videos I'll be doing, all the intermediate stuff I'll be doing, I'll be showing all the different ways you can do that. But it has been very, very difficult, and us coming into kind of July now, the, the weather will start changing, and when we get into September, it'll be even harder. But we'll get through it. And we'll get good videos out. Yeah, I, I think it's. Uh, I I appreciate that you had the same struggles that I did because I think that everybody does. You know, seeing yeah. like, oh, this is easy. I could to do start, this too. Yeah. Gosh, it it. We had one day that we were videotaping and. I swear that the little airport by our house was like sending planes up. Like every time we'd say, okay, let's do this and search. And it was like a plane, and then another plane, <laughs> another plane. It's like, and then all of a sudden we get through that and the wind picks up and now the wind is in the mic. And it's like, you've got to be kidding me. It was, it was incredibly frustrating. But, um, but once you're through it, then that's not even the end of it. Then it has to be edited and then it has to be put together. And it's, it's, it's a process, but, um, but it's one that, that based on specifically the event, I mean, it's a pretty special thing that we have put together. So, what? Uh, tell me about your impression of of the Strike Force event and just kind of you know whether it's the people or what you yeah. saw. Like when you see this community, what do you see? Yeah, I loved it. The atmosphere was great at the Strike Force. Everyone was having a laugh. It was really good. There was no pressure on dogs. Everyone was really willing to learn. Um, especially if a dog did something wrong, that's okay. We were talking about it. We would work it all out, and I think people got educated from it. I really do think people took a lot from it. Um, but I say the atmosphere was fantastic. The weather was a wee bit hot, but everyone I met was really nice, really wanting to get to know me. And everyone was really interested in, in the different styles of training. So everyone's kind of wanting to learn something new, which is always really good. Um, but no, I was really impressed with it. And organisation-wise, was outstanding. There was a lot went on behind the scenes, but it ran very smooth. I was really, really chuffed with it. It was really nice. I think it worked out great. I think everyone really took something from the day. Yeah, I, I agree. My, what was your favorite part of the event? 
Um, probably the last re- last couple of retrieves we did when we were up, we had a big group at the back of us and we ran over all the retrieves. Um, we, we did four retrieves with each dog, um, and every dog has a fault. And when the dog had a fault, we would sit and talk about it, go over it all. Um, I think you learn more that way than actually just running it yourself and trying to go over the problem yourself. But I think everyone took from it pretty good. Yeah, that was by far my favorite part yeah. too. And a couple of things that I loved about it was. So we had the last part that Lewis was talking about. We took half a day and everybody grabbed a chair and their tents and we just sat as a big group and had two dogs come up at a time and run and we had the advanced dogs come up together and meet it and so on. And there are a few things that I took away from there. One, it can be very intimidating running your dog in front of a group of people. Excuse me. And, and I think that that's, that is a... Um, something that I don't think people were as intimidated because of the environment that we had. So the whole purpose of this thing was get these dogs in front of us as things are going on that Lewis and I could make either observations or help somebody work through an issue. And then we can talk to the whole group about it. I mean, we had, you know, probably that second day because not everybody can make both days, but we probably had 70 some people yeah, there easy, eh? and they're all right, right by us. Right. And we could talk through everything really easily. A lot of great questions. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was really fun to watch how the handlers of the dog we were critiquing handled it. Like nobody got defensive, nobody got, and everybody loved the feedback. But, um, what I loved about it is how encouraging everybody was, right? So there was one dog in particular that really was struggling, struggle, 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 struggle. And then we got him through it and got him to pick that, uh, that bumper. Oh my gosh. And like everybody's Friend cheering and clapping. And it was, I've never in my life been around a group of as genuine people that we had there that truly wanted to see everybody else be as successful as possible. And that's very unique, especially for a dog group. Especially for uh, for training dogs, yeah. Everyone's usually always very competitive and wanting to hit each other's throats, but the atmosphere was fantastic. And I think that's the best atmosphere to learning. You, know, you, you relax, the dog relaxes, everything goes a bit more smoother. But no, it was really good, like especially that wee dog that overcame its blind. That was really good. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that was that was a really good one. Um, were there any dogs that you felt like, as you kind of reflect back, any dogs that just kind of stand out to you? Yeah, there was a there's a really nice eighteen month old yellow dog, the Bell, I think it was. Mm-hmm. It was very nice, very tidy. That was a Clyde puppy for uh, those uh, uh, Riverstone followers. Yeah, but, but no, he was, he was very nice. nice. Yeah, and then. Brittany had a, a nice little bitch at eight months old. She was nailing marks at 140 yards. At eight months old, was outstanding. Really good potential in her. She was going really nice. Um, very novice handlers. It just shows that it's all in the breeding. Really, really nice. Um, she was my standout dog, I would say. Um, just purely because the, the the handler's very novice, so the dog is basically doing it all on her own merit. I mean, she's just doing it for them, really, guiding away, and it's great to see that. Yeah, well, uh, Brittany was even crying after yeah, some of those. Right, yeah, 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 she was and She's loving it. That and that w- that's what was really fun is watching how how passionate she was about it, and then watching that little dog go succeed and really do as well as that young dog did. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that she said that that she had never done anything like no, that before. Right. Or it was just the, the, the dog hadn't had anything over fifty yards. Yeah, then at the end of the day, she was hitting. What was it, 145 yard marks? You know, she was doing a double, doing a send back as well. I mean, I stepped it on him. Yeah, amazing. Aye. Hitting him hard, like, it was great. Great to see. Running into the wind, spot on, like, just total natural. Right. Well, th- another Riverstone puppy. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, that uh, that was really, really interesting. So, that that pup that, uh, that Lucy talked about actually was sired by. Do. One of your dogs. Yep, big do, yeah, mm. big do boy. So that's it's all in the breeding. It, it really <laughs> is. It really is. Uh, well, so what's what's funny? So when you see her, that little girl run, do you see a yeah, lot I of see his do. qualities? Yeah, I see a lot of do. Just flat running. Do it. I'll get it, Dad. I know what I'm doing. I'll sort it. And it's it's great to see. It's just total natural. Really good flat running dog. What we call. Uh, just want to get it. Just really in there. No messing about, you know, no mucking about, just get out and do it and get back, you know. Love to see it, like, it's brilliant. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that, you know, we see it, we're fortunate enough to get to see it a lot, you know, through the kennel is, you know, when you get 
Brock puppies in. They act like Brock. When mm-hmm. you get Clyde puppies in, they act like Clyde. And it's amazing how how similar they are. And people you have people just ooh and ah about it, right? Mm-hmm. But it is it's breeding. And this is the thing that I really try to preach and really try to harp on because we we saw this at the strike force event too. We saw dogs that quite frankly they're not as good, right? Or whether that's breeding wise, whether that's talent wise, whether that's intelligence wise, whether that's trainability wise. You can just tell, like yep. they're just not gonna be, you know. There's nothing that that person can do. Like they can do the best that they can and get them as far as they can, but when you put those dogs side by side, I mean, the the ceiling's so much higher with this other one, yeah. and that's all the breeding. There was there was a lot of dogs there. Just they would pick the dummy, but they just weren't that interested. You can see, um, even the build, the size of them, things like that. They were just not built for the job. But it's all into breeding at the end of the day, and they can train and train and train. But if the dog's not wanting to do it, then you're kind of fighting the tide as it is, you know. Um, but the only, thing, the only thing you can do is buy from the best and hope for the best. Um, that's all you can really do. It doesn't always work out, but you've got yourself a lot better chance that they would succeed. For sure. Yeah, for sure. So um, this is not your first trip across the pond. Oh, no, yeah. And this is not your first trip that you and I have got to hang out and do uh, do dog, dog stuff, I should say. Uh, tell us a little bit about... Your impression, and you do not have to hold back on this. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe don't be. <laughs> maybe, 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 yeah, maybe hold back a little bit. Um, impressions that you've seen with the British labs versus the American labs, as far as the the you know breeding, you know British line versus American line. Yeah, so it's quite. Un- I've got an unusual um, circumstance back at the kennel because I've actually got on a fully bred American FC. Labrador, so his sire and dam are completely FC bred. So, and with that, I meaning is there no any British in the dog at all? Which is all American, all American, full American. Yep. So he's a big, tall, s- strong-looking dog. I got him off a friend that imported him, um, and he was just too much for the handler. Um, I got him at seven months old. The difference in those that dog to my bred dogs is unbelievable, and I'm not just saying that. Even just temperament, he has absolutely no off switch. It's just go, go, go every every second of the day. He paces in his kennel all day. Um, Hunting-wise, he's just not got the style. You know, he's out. Our dogs, they'll, they'll start hunting, they'll get down low, their tail will go, they look they look really nice to watch. He literally goes out and stands, and he'll look, and he won't move. That's something I'm not a big fan of. I'm getting him out of it a wee bit. It's kind of naturally coming back, but the natural hunt mentality is just not there. Um, size wise as well, he's a lot bigger. He'll maybe be double the size of my British labs. Um, again, that's good for big trial stuff. It's not so good in the house. If he's in the house and he's it's double the size, I mean he's a big boy. Like he's going to get ke- knock you over in the kitchen and things like that. And when you when you say double the size, you're talking height wise, yeah, not necessarily like he's height, not- leg wise, neck wise, um, big long snout he's got. I'm sure he'll fill in when he's. I mean he's about a year old just now. But I'm sure he'll fill out when he gets a bit older. Um, I've done a good job of screwing him down so that he's not as hyper. But if you're buying a British lab, then it should all be there. N- wanting to switch off, being calm around the house, things like that. That all comes naturally, but it just doesn't seem to come natural for him. He's just a wired like a like a head case, you know, to the moon. But it's good if you were doing big field trials, big, big long retrieves, but it's not something that suits us. What we want to do, like shooting every day and... Sitting at a drive with 200 birds landing in front of you. But I'm sure it'll make them good. It's just going to take a lot more time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, much much different approach on your end as far as yeah. the trainer goes, right? 100%. Just need to, everything needs to be in slow motion, as I say. Um, take your time. There's no rushing. We do not need to push him with retrieving. He's just an absolute maniac retriever. Um, which is good in a way, but it's hard to control. Um, Vocal-wise in the kennel, he's, he's pretty good. Uh, Vocal-wise, we... we uh, training is fine, but that's because I know what I'm doing. But I feel if that was in the wrong hands, then you would have a problem with a screamer or a whiner or something like that. But I know what I'm looking for. That's the difference. But to a novice handler, you would be you would be struggling there, you know. Yeah. So I, I want to dig in a little bit to a comment that you had made during, I want to say it was day two of uh, Strike Force, and you had made a comment that. That some of the people with younger dogs are they're it's like they're panicking, right? So if, if something isn't going perfectly well, they're panicking. 
And you and I got to talk about this pretty in detail, actually. Yep, Nate, yeah. And you know, we had talked about how when someone gets a dog and it's their only dog and they're looking at this thing going, this is my commitment for the next, God willing, 15 years, this has to work out, right? Because whether it's, you know, I don't have room for another one or, you know, my family won't allow to have another one, whatever it is, right? So if this is the only one, it has to work out, then there's some amplified pressure and then that person likely doesn't have the luxury that you and I have of seeing so many dogs all the time, right? So we see a dog at, you know, 12 months old and understand that, hey, there's some maturity issues. You know, there's some things we still need to work over. We have to take our time. This is going to take time where, yeah, the dog next to them might be looking light years ahead right now, but that doesn't mean they're, they'll finish that way. Easier for you and I to say that versus somebody else, you know? So you dig into that a little bit as far as just, the, the patient side of developing these dogs? Yeah, one, one of the biggest thing is um, I, I train quite a lot of dogs up to about a year old. So I'm in the kind of happy way that I can I can see, I can read a dog better than if you're just running the one dog all the time. So I can maybe have seven or eight young dogs that I'm running through. So I can see if like if a dog makes a mistake, fair enough. We know how to correct it. We'll not take our time. We'll just, we'll just take our time with it. There's no need to rush and try and push that dog more. Whereas I've got young dogs that are really far ahead, some that are really like slowing down, they're not as far on. But because I'm training these amount of dogs, I can actually say, well, this one's going too fast. We can maybe slow his training down a bit. This one's maybe struggling a bit. We'll, we'll put a bit more time into him or we'll let him mature a bit more or something like that. Whereas if you've just got the one dog, you're only seeing that one dog. So you've not really got comparison to anything else. Uh, but that makes a big difference, especially if you're running four or five dogs on. You can say, well, and, and the other big thing as well is with the pressure of that test that we were doing, the training day, if a dog makes a mistake, people were really losing it. Like they were getting really stressed out. Oh my God, she's made a mistake and it's a big drop. The dog's made a mistake. It's young, big wow. You know, we'll just we'll sort that problem. We'll step back a bit. We'll see where we went wrong and we'll just continue from there. But I think nine, nine out of 10 were okay, but I would say maybe 40%, especially the young dogs. If something went wrong, they were really stressing out. Again, the, you stress out, the dog stresses out, the dog comes back and healed, you're, you're stressed out, worrying. So it, it's just a big chain of events. But because we're running a lot of dogs, we can see what level we really want them to be and I can just take my time with them. But it's training, so if the dog does something wrong, it's actually quite a good thing because you can correct it. But say, just try not to be stre too stressed out. That was my biggest thing for the weekend. Um, especially with a, a big crowd watching, it can be quite stressful, like, if folk aren't used to running under pressure um, and the dog going wrong, it just adds to the pressure. Mm -hmm. But that was my biggest take in the weekend, especially on the Friday. Yeah. And and you, from our standpoint too, we could really dissect the handlers as well. You know, and so here's what I, I truly found interesting, I guess, on my end was that owners were getting a little stressed out about a dog's, you know, mistake, but, Oftentimes it was their mistake mm -hmm. as the handler that led to that dog's mistake. And and that takes some serious self-reflection. That's why we talk so much about training the handler, or training the trainer in the program is because at the end of the day, you're the one that has to drive the ship. You're the one that has to coach this team. And if you're not on par, you're never going to get there. You know, so something as much as uh, I'm trying to think of an example on the fly, when you blow the whistle, right? So if you blow the whistle to stop the dog on, on any kind of a handling situation, and you're two to three seconds behind, that is going to be that much more out of control, that much more out of bounds, that much more difficult to stay in line to where you're wanting. And that's not the dog's fault, right? That That's yours, the handler, and then you just watch this ball of twine just unravel and unravel and unravel. And um, and then, too, you know, from a handler standpoint, I felt like there was a lot of... Um, yeah, I, I think you could make the argument that part of this was maybe some of that, you know, just not being on par as, as far as, you know, the timing of. But I also felt, felt like there was a lot of times that people were just letting their dogs roll, hoping that the dog would just Do make a correction or just get there rather than just stopping them, keeping them under control and putting them, them there from a handling standpoint. Um, but, you know, that's all, that all comes with time. I mean, that... I believe this is one of the biggest things that people got out of this was just watching and understanding, oh, this is what I have to do different. 
Yeah, and it doesn't help with a big crowd watching as well. Right. To be honest, it's it's hard for people, especially if you aren't used to that type of environment for running a dog. So if, as you're saying there, they're hoping the dog will pick it clean. Like some of the dogs were never going to pick it clean, but they were letting them go, hoping that it would. But you're better actually helping the dog out all the time. But that that is true. What you're saying the environment doesn't help. Although everyone was very like happy and helping out but, and clapping and things, but it was still quite a high-pressure situation. It was oh, still intimidating, yeah, for sure. Yeah, very high. For sure. Based in, in front of a group of 70 people. Right. So uh, let's talk about handling. You know, mm-hmm. we're kind of going down that route. So um, tell us first about some handling differences that you see, you know, at home yeah. versus here. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot that we can go well, on here, but, but you know, kind of go through there and, and I'll, I'll jump in as well. Yeah, I could go on all day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some, I was very, very surprised with the sends of the dogs. Big, loud backs, like, back, really, really yeah, loud. You, you, can, you can do it. Back, <laughs> really amazingly loud. Um, it was, it's just, I don't feel there's any need for that at all. I mean, I always train the dog that, in, in a kind of metaphor term, that it's, it's like a, a, a pulled back catapult all the time. So all you're needing is just a wee word, off he goes, flat out. Whereas the big, big saying is, if anything, it intimidates the dog. The dog's actually going, oh, man, you know, like, oh, jeez, that's a loud send. That was a big surprise. Uh, the the pitch of the whistles were extru- <laughs> incredibly loud. <laughs> Standing next to a boy that nearly took my eardrum out. <laughs> that was a surprise. But, yeah, well, I mean. Lewis was standing there in this guy had oh. I can't remember who it was. Not intentionally, of course, no. but he had one of the really big, it was like a Tallahassee or some kind of whistle, if you guys know your whistles. And it was like, boop! And I thought Lewis's eyeballs were going to pop out of his head. Oh, and he turned and looked at me like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it, it caught me good. Like, I was <laughs> really struggling with that year for a wee bit. But that that was a real surprise, um, especially with the big, big, loud whistles. The dogs are 60 yards. They can hear them, no problem. You know what I mean? I think some handlers think the louder they blow the whistle, the more chance the dog's got of stopping. Um, I mean, I think that's exactly it. That's a, it's, yeah. a, it's just a f- more frustration thing sometimes when the dog's not stopping. That was a massive surprise because I mean, I mean, I can stop dogs in, in a silent whistle at hundred yards. You know, if I showed them that, they, they probably wouldn't believe it. You know, um, the the thunder whistle was a big surprise, and a big surprise was uh, your lefts and rights are both over and overs. You know, you don't differentiate a side, mm-hmm. which was I was really surprised about. So what I always do is I use away as my left and get on as my right. Of course, you can't do your angled backs, but I think it helps a lot more in a shooting situation. So I can handle a dog without the dog seeing me. So quite quite often, I'll if, if we're on a hill or I'm standing at a dike or a bank or a stone wall, if you know about it, and I'm handling a dog, I can just jump down behind the dike and I'll give him a left or a right and see if he's taking it. And when the dog gets older and gets more used to it, they'll learn to handle out of sight without handles, if you know what I mean, mm-hmm. which helps a lot in blinds and hunting situations where you can't see the dog, especially in our field trials where we, most of our dog handling is out of sight, which would really help. Mm-hmm. When when we had a big crowd of 70 people behind us at that last day and the dogs were just not picking anyone out, that would have came in really handy. Mm-hmm. You could have just pumped them, just pipped them over, it would help them, you know. Well, and so what Lewis is talking about here is the the dog is in an area that you can you can make out where the dog is, but the dog can't make you out. And you think about you know, for those of us here in the states, how often you would find yourself in these hunting situations, right? Whether it's the blind that you're in, you can't get out of to handle. Whether it's uh, you know, the the dog's going through maybe some thicker you know thicker cover where you can kind of make the dog out going, but the dog you know, can't turn and actually take a cast. Well. In that case, you kind of just have to let the dog go, right? Unless you stop them and call them back to you. But from a handling standpoint, what he's saying is that because we're saying over, you know, the dog oftentimes isn't going to, you know, take the direction. Like a lot of times what I've done in a situation, I find myself like that, I'll cut my hands over my mouth and I'll say like over and like, you know, take my, my head and kind of like swoosh it off to the right, hoping that the, the vo- my voice moving to the right will push the dog to the right. But what he's saying is that he has is get on to the right, mm-hmm. right? Oh, he's left, yeah. Right, so get on would be, okay, the dog knows which way to go, and he's going to go. He doesn't have to see Lewis. Yeah. A lot a lot of people in Scotland and England are still doing get on, get on both ways. 
but your your people that are actually doing lefts and rights with advanced handling, like blind handling. I mean, we're even handling them over hills now, over out completely out of sight, hundred yard over hills, over fences, dikes, and the judge will actually tell us when the dog is in the area. So we can we can stop the dog left handed. Judge is saying he's in the area. Stop him. Hold him there. If the dog goes right handed, the judge will say he's going right handed. We can stop him left hand again back into the area. But things like that. I mean, when we started doing that, it's something that was kind of new and. Everyone was like, well, what's this about? But when you actually use it in the field, like picking up, especially with duck blinds, that's a big one. When you're standing full camo, the dog's 150 yards away, they can't pick you out. Mm-hmm. And it, it just gives that dog a wee bit more of an edge to try and help, especially like when they can't see you. Um, even if you're over hills and things, you can still stop them and handle them. It's, it's, it's a great tool. But we do that quite a lot. And I think it would have helped a lot of people at that mm-hmm. test. But if you don't train for it, then... It's not going to sort it in a weekend. <laughs> right, right. You know? Well, I, I personally, I had a few people just say, that was a tremendous thing for me because I'm a hunter and I want to be able to handle my dog in a truly blind situation there where the dog can't see me. I think I had a lot of people you know, really picked up on that. I do think a lot of people really did understand and appreciate the obedience side of things. Yeah. About that just being cleaned up to you know the utmost point of what they can because mm-hmm. that is it's incredibly important. It's oh. it's what makes the whole thing go around. Hundred percent. Like, and there was a lot of people, um, with, especially with the double that I did, uh, taking forever to line the dog, forever like maybe a minute to line the dog in a blind. That that type of lining, it's just it's just not going to help anything. The dog's getting worried. It's getting stressed. It's actually forgot about the other retrieve completely at this point, and. Things like that. I actually prefer getting the dog into a routine to follow your knee, but I can show you in the video, the retriever roadmap videos that will be coming out. But things like that, like wee things, it makes such a big difference, especially with the obedience. But if you get them solid, then it makes things a lot easier when we're older and we're doing advanced stuff. But that's one big thing I've seen as well, is taking forever to line blinds. That's the difference between an American and a British training. Like, we would get f- three seconds to line and send, whereas some people are taking 10, 15 seconds. Mm-hmm. That's a big surprise that I like. Did you see a difference between the British line dogs versus the American line dogs in breaking down and holding an area of a mark? Yeah, so, like, again, it, it comes down to a lot of to do with the training, um, but you can see a lot more natural work from the British dogs, as in they're going to hit an area, they know they're roughly there, they'll start hunting. So most of the American... Red labs just run. Mm-hmm. They're flat out past it. They're 50, 60, 100 yards past it by the time they're stopping it. Whereas your British labs have got a kind of depth perception. They're going out there, right, it's here somewhere and we'll start hunting. Whereas you can start telling the dog, no, no, we want you to go deeper, we want you to come closer. The American lab just let, just flat out, mm-hmm. as we call the leg it. <laughs> and they're, fl- leg it. they're going for it, you know. And But if, I, I did a mark on a hill and most some of the American dogs were over that, 100 yards past it before they even touch the whistle, you know, it makes it a wee bit harder. Well, and the hard part with the dog like that is that if they miss that mark by two feet on the wrong wind side of it and they're just running, they're going to keep running, mm-hmm. right? Like it's very now, hard to if, if they hit on the right wind side of it and they catch that scent, boom, okay, it look looks great. looks good, looks mm-hmm. pretty. But if they miss it just by that much on the wrong side, it looks that, you know, as pretty as it could have looked, it looks that much, yeah. you know, unpretty. The old, the old saying is just, there's no point in having a Ferrari if you've not got a steering wheel, you know. There you go. Or brakes, that's the thing. Um, but they look good when they do it right. But it's when they go wrong, that's when it really shows and they look terrible, eh? mm-hmm. I just feel the British labs have just got a wee bit, more, wee bit more sense of distance, depth, perception than hunting. They'll actually go out in a hunting area rather than just run. That's what I prefer it prefer a hunting dog you can always take that out of them a wee bit and get them running but you can never put the hunting into them for sure yeah for sure what do you think the biggest thing that you took away from the way that you either hunt and or compete versus the way that we do like is there anything that stood out that's like i was really shocked that you guys did this or you uh, besides the whistle was a mm-hmm. big one besides the big vocalization you know yeah. was there anything else that kind to of be honest up? the collar was a big surprise like oh, yeah. um i was really surprised with the collar and the people correcting the dogs on retrieves i, I have no experience with the collar i don't use the, ever use the collar but i was very very surprised how many times people use it mm-hmm. you know like they're not the, the dog it's a hard one because some handlers know what they're doing fair enough i feel that people weren't actually 100 percent sure th- that the dog, what the dog was doing. So there's a fine line between the dog knowing that it's doing something and it's doing it wrong 
by accident doesn't know the, the what you want it to do and then there's dogs that are like no I want to do what I want to do here mm-hmm. but I think that the handlers are, are, are finding it hard to differentiate between the two but I was really surprised how many times they used it and maybe even one retrieved Nick corrected three or four times with the collar I was really mm-hmm. surprised with that yeah and, and I think this too comes down to the experience of the handler right because if you're if you're a coach and you're not overly experienced you're probably going to you know, misguide your your players more way more easily than a more experienced coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's one one dog. I'm just gonna say, Austin. You know, we love you. We're not picking on you, right? Um, but I know that she's gonna listen to this. And and but this was to me one of the best learning retrieves mm-hmm. that we had maybe the entire you know time together was you know the dog that you know she was not sitting quite as sharply. As she wanted to, so she'd tweet and she'd kind of slow roll and turn, but then she wanted him to sit, you know, to sit down, so mm-hmm. she'd give the collar, and that dog was sucking back into her, and you know, just the dog being confused and unsure just kept making the dog want to, you know, bring back, and the clarity was not there. The dog didn't understand why the yeah. correction was being made. I didn't know, yeah, and to be honest, I actually didn't know that she was using the collar. To be really honest, and I was like, what is that dog? Why is this dog doing this? Like, I was really, really surprised. And then after it was explained that she was using the collar, and that may all made sense, but that was me not knowing the collar. I've never used the collar, so I don't know what dogs react like. But I was really surprised with that, and I didn't realise that's what the collar was getting used for. But again, that's just learning from our side. Um, mm-hmm. It's not something we ever use, so I wouldn't know. But no, I was really surprised. Well, were there any other tools that that you maybe saw or didn't see that you're like, why don't you guys use this? Or why do why did you guys use this? Or is there anything that stood out that way to you? Um, one, one of my retrieves, I did, uh, I did a mark at the back. And then on the route to the mark, we stopped the dog and gave it a left hand over, as you call it, mm-hmm. um, square with the mark. So obviously every dog was wanting to suck up to the mark, pick the mark, pick the mark. But it's something that you guys really don't do much of, like lefts and rights onto a mark. Mm-hmm. Um, we do that a lot in Scotland, especially for like driven stuff. We leaving live birds, uh, dead birds and going for live birds. But that's something that people, I think, will go back and work on. Um, that's one big surprise. I thought dogs would do that pretty straightforward, and I think it was only two dogs, I think, did it clean. Mm-hmm. Everyone else really struggled, really struggled, and everyone said, oh, I'm going to do this when I get home. Mm-hmm. Everyone said the same thing. But if you don't train for it, you don't do it. But mostly every dog was wanting to go straight back, and they would all handle back. You give them a left, they go back left. They never actually do a straight left over. That was my biggest surprise with them, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. You're saying with equipment, but that's one of my biggest ones. For sure. No, that's great. Well, I uh, I am I'm super excited because I will be going over now with you here in a mm-hmm. few months and getting to spend some time with you. And we're going to do some shooting and some yep. training. Get some deer. Uh, ho- hopefully, get uh, <laughs> get a, a deer or two. That'd be fantastic. Um, and and now you know what's fun about this is that now I get to go basically have that same experience now, you know, back with you and, and get to kind of immerse myself in what you guys are doing over there. And I'm sure there's going to be even more every time I'm there, you know, there's takeaways that I can bring back and you know, there are things that, that quite frankly don't apply. You know, yeah. I think that's a fair point too, yep, because definitely. you guys hunt and, and compete so much different than we do. So it's not like we can just take everything that you're doing or you could take everything that we're doing because not all of it applies, but there's certainly a lot of, cr- of crossover that can be applied and, and utilized on both sides. Yeah, definitely. Like, and you see that when you're over, when we're training and we're shooting over the dogs. It's just completely different environments, different ways of training. Our, we are a lot more stricter. We heal work in trials and things, but you'll see it all when you're over. It'll be good. Hopefully try and get a buck or two and <laughs> see how we go on from there. Right. No, that, that would be fantastic. Um is there anything else? Well, what give me your your impression on the retriever roadmap? You know, community. You know, is is this you know group you're you're excited to get in you know, involved with? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. To, I can't wait to go over and get the videos, get my teeth into intermediate now, and get going with it. The 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 community is great. Everyone's sent me messages, and I think everyone's really enjoyed it. I really enjoy the program, and I it's, it's going to grow for there. I think it'd be great. And I just hope everyone at the event had a good time and. My retrieves weren't too tricky. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we, we did. Uh, we had some fun things, like we had a, a crawfish boil. Um, we had some some very great. Uh, I'm gonna say great because they are great, great people. Uh, their members, you'll pull up their crawfish trailer and put up a, a crawfish you'll boil for us from down in Texas, and a lot of really cool and, and unique things. But that's what stood out. Yeah, man, it's just the people. Mm-hmm. You know, the people are just you know so fantastic, and and people are going to continue to grow 
with their dogs. I saw, I heard a number of people say that after observing, you know, they, they didn't really maybe know where they were at, right? Or maybe I, I thought I was more ahead than I saw it in person. Mm-hmm. And that is a very unique thing. You know, again, you and I are very fortunate to see the number of dogs we do every day. Most people aren't. So when you get in that group, you know, group area, like, gosh, like I thought my dog was way further ahead because your dog does the same few retrieves you set up for them most days, right? And yep. they get really good at it and they look really good at it. But throwing them off their game and putting them in a new environment, yeah, it just shakes it up and kind of it's a good reset for you as a handler mentally to be like, okay, so where am I at? And where do I have to go from here to go be successful? Again, there's dogs there that, that they didn't even give them 20 yard retrieves and we just let her go for it for the 140 yarders and she was hitting them every time. They so couldn't she, believe it. They literally sitting bawling their eyes out, couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's not only do you see your dogs not going as far ahead, but you can sh- exceed your expectations as well. I mean, that wee dog was going great, and she would never, ever have tried that if we weren't there. Mm-hmm. She would never have given those retrieves to the dog. But again, the wee dog's more than capable. Mm-hmm. We've got our eyes open there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was one of the funnest parts for me is watching people when they would say, I don't know if my dog can do this, right? So there, there was somebody, there was actually multiple people on the second day when we did the group where we did, uh, we did a mark. It was probably at about 120 yards, and then... After the dog was sent on the mark, we'd throw a bumper behind them. They'd stop them and bring them back in, pick that one up, and then go run that first original mark as a memory. And it's all about control, right? So your dog sees it go down. If they're going to fight you, it's probably here, right? Because they think they know right where they're going. You tell them to stop. They're probably gonna, If they're going to fight you, it's probably going to be in a situation like this. And the number of people that came up, they're like, I, I don't know if they'll do it, but we'll give it a go. I don't know if there was anyone we didn't get, we didn't work through it. Yeah. I think was everyone even, was uh, successful. Someone even says, oh, my dog doesn't stop in the whistle. I, he hardly stops in the whistle. He says, well, we'll just try it. Did it perfect. Yeah, right. You know? And he's like, oh, wow, that, that was good. <laughs> you know, says, well, you can, there's, no, there's no worries in trying it and failing. You just you just set the dog up again, do it again so that it succeeds. But that that's one of the ones I noticed, especially we were saying with the novice intermediate dogs, is people aren't willing to try, you know, and even try to succeed and fail rather than actually doing it and then correcting the problem. But they'd rather not do it and not fail. Do you know what I mean? Whereas they're better actually failing than actually correcting it. Right. And that was you a know? comment that you made after the first day is, I, I wish some of these people would just try it. Just try it. And, yeah. and, and, and not be so correct, worried about it. Yeah, then we can correct it and show how we correct it, rather than actually not doing it at all and just saying, I'll pick the straight mark and I'll do that. <laughs> we'll do that fine. <laughs> Whereas you're better actually getting it wrong and then finding out how to correct it. Because you're never going to get more advanced with a dog if you don't. Right. If you don't push it, you know. Right. Well, and, and you're not truly failing unless you just give up yep. and say, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Exactly. Because if you can take away something to go make an improvement on and go progress, that's not a failure. That's a learning lesson. Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of that. And I would say day two, there was a lot of learning, I think, for both of us on day one of how to handle the group of this size, how to handle this number of dogs, how to handle this number of, of your handlers. Because especially when you want to help everybody, there's a lot going on that you can't just sit there and take the time and be like, hey, we're going to take a half hour per person because we don't have that kind of time. Mm-hmm. And so how do you how do you teach on the fly? How do you help on the fly? How do you be as productive as you can? But we were able to make, through some announcements at the beginning of day two, some things like that. Like, mm-hmm. we want to see you guys try this stuff. We want, we want to see you put yourself, put yourself in a vulnerable situation. Let's see how the dog does because I bet they surprise you. And most of the time, these owners were, were blown away. I remember one uh, one guy, uh, his name's Craig. Like he's he told me he's like she's not going to stop on the whistle. And we're like, well, you've been working on it, so let's try it. Boop, stop. And he's, he he didn't know what to do initially, right? And I think you even said bring her back in, you know, like towards that that one you threw behind because I think he was so shocked that she stopped. It's he was like, stopped. oh, you know. And uh, it, it's just it's so interesting to me. But I think a lot of this is. These dogs, we get so emotionally wrapped up in them that they're an extension of us. And so we don't want to fail or look like a failure. So we don't want to put our dog in a situation to look like a failure. Um, and so we just don't put them in the situation to begin with. Yeah. You know, how many times do people have a dog that had a fault, like a whine, right? Or, or being vocal. And people are like, oh, but, but, but that's my fault. You know, that's my fault. I did this one. It's like, no, Excuse. that's probably not. You know, probably has a lot to do with breeding temperament, right? Like, it's okay. Like, 
I understand that that this is your dog and you don't want the dog to be like that and you're embarrassed about it, but let's not have rose colored glasses on. Let's call it for what it is, mm-hmm. right? And that was something I found really interesting was how the dynamic with owners and their dogs, how it, it would really hold people back more than anything. And, and again, I think we got to talk through this to the point that people, I think, I really think I was extremely happy with the end of day two with how everyone was encouraged, everybody was doing it, everybody was happy to be up there, and they were putting themselves in those situations. Yeah, because I don't think if, if we hadn't had the day before, I don't think many folk would actually have went in front of the crowd and went for it. Mm-hmm. I think everyone would have just says, no, no, on you go, we'll we'll sit back and watch. Whereas most of the people that went and ran it actually did, did it really good. They ran it really great. And it's just when they won it. Again, it's doing the job and failing and actually correcting it rather than not doing it at all. Mm. But... It's, it's a big thing I've noticed, especially with novice handlers as well. I think the more dogs you train, the more, like if, if you if you go through maybe 10, 15 dogs a year training, you, you get a bit more freer, a bit looser with the dog so that you let her away with a lot more so that you can correct it and get the best out of the dog rather than being, oh my God, the dog did that wrong. What mm-hmm. are we going to do? But you just say, well, well, we'll sort it. It's fine. We've got plenty of time. But that's where we're at the advantage where somebody with one dog is struggling a bit, mm-hmm. um, especially when it's their home pet, you know. Um, yeah, it was really good. I really mm. enjoyed it. What uh, if you were to give kind of a blank, a blanket uh, piece of advice to everyone out there, just based on kind of what you've seen, you know, in your in your times over here? Because remember, last time you were here, you came for Game Fair. Mm-hmm. So just because we haven't got to talk about that, do you remember Game Fair? Yeah, I do. It was great. Yeah. So what was? Is there anything that stuck out there to you? No, it was. It was pretty good. I mean, again, there's a lot of handlers that were. That were blowing the big whistles and things like that, and a bit stressed out. But if uh, the, you're saying with the one piece of advice there, it's in my head. Everyone should just slow down. See when they're walking their dogs, they're healing, they're handling everything. Just in st- do it all in slow motion. There's no rush. There's so many dogs I've seen there. The handlers stressed out and rushing and fast and doing everything too fast, trying to get the lead on the dog like really, really fast. And everything just needs to get taken down, slow down a bit. Mm-hmm. Especially with like pups and novice dogs, like. The, the, the people r- rugby tackling dogs coming back like to try and get them in the lead the dog's going to stand there and, and come back and love the dummy and just stand there and heal it's not going to run off and chase sheep or something you know <laughs> they just never need sheep. To, we don't have as many sheep here as you do yeah we, we've got a few <laughs> sheep yeah but they just need to calm down a bit slow down that'd be my greatest bit of advice and just take your time mm-hmm. also try your dog and if it fails big wow we'll, we'll make it easier mm-hmm. that's my, what I've kind of gave out the most in the whole the weekend, but I say slow down. I mean, some some of the handlers were were really stressing out about it, you know, mm-hmm. um, trying to do things far too fast. But that would be my biggest bit of advice. The social media effect. Everybody yep. wants it right now. Everyone wants it now, and it's already right sending a dog 150 yards and a and a mark that the thing's going to set the head the the ground on fire and pick it. But when it comes back and your dog's jumping a bit like crazy and like trying to deliver the dummy and running about mad, that is because the handler's getting too fast for it. Everything needs to be slow. Dog comes in, dummy, he'll sit down, relax a bit, then put the lead on. Not grab the dummy, grab the dog, grab the lead, try and throw the lead on him. You know, everything's hyper. That was a big thing. There's a lot of dogs like that. And and if they just calmed down a bit and slowed down, it would be the dogs would be much more settled. Do you think that starts at the puppy stage? Yeah, 100%. And... The, the handler getting stressed out as well with it and it's just 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 basic obedience again you know take your time with obedience just everything slow if you go nice and calm and steady with your obedience and if the dog does something wrong just correct it nice and gentle nice and easy the dog will be calmer it's when you skip these stages and you're trying to do big marks blinds everything the dog just gets hyped up and um, you could see that a lot at the weekend <laughs> but again obedience yeah, it'll be, isn't it amazing how often it comes back to that? Yeah, 100%. It's almost every time. Yeah, really, when you have um, uh, any kind of an issue, you can almost trace it back to obedience yep. just about every time. Pretty much. Literally sitting in your back garden, that's 99% what it is comes out of. Even deliveries with dummies and things, that's back to obedience again. Just mm-hmm. coming in, sitting with the dummy, it's just all basics. But again, if you're not doing them, it shows up later down the line, which a lot of the handlers are finding out. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But again, obedience, obedience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have uh, a couple of people that you know. Have you? Do you remember the first time you saw a dog run a blind retrieve? 
But when I was younger or when yeah, I was at Game Fair? The first not time. really, no. It was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> Can't remember what I did last week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I do, and it was pretty mind-blowing. Like, I didn't know a dog was capable of that, right? And now I'm so desensitized to it because we literally do it every day. But every once in a while now, we do get someone around us that has never seen it before. It's like, oh, my gosh, how do you get your dog to do that? Mm-hmm. And it's obedience. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a high level of obedience, but it is obedience. Mm-hmm. I mean, at, at all levels, whether it's the stop, whether it's the cast, whether it's the you know, come back after the retrieve, it's everything about it is obedience. Mm-hmm. Every, everything's done. I always, I always get everything uh, perfect at 70 yards. That's my kind of go-to age. Up to a year old, 70 yards. Is there a spot on there? Just increase the distance. Again, obedience in the back garden. That's mm-hmm. You can do marks, you can do blinds. If you've, Even if you've got a garden at 30 square metres, you can still do sandbags, blinds, everything like that, close to you. Um, once they're doing that there, then get bigger. Mm-hmm. You know, If the dog fails at that distance, go back a bit shorter until you're doing it perfect again. But everyone's trying to run the 150-yard blinds and mm-hmm. through water and over dikes and things, and they're not doing this. It's, yeah, and it shows, you know, it's quite frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how, how many dogs... Um, yeah, every most people are very open about this, but they're like, ah, oh, like, I know I hold the dog back. Yeah, I'm the biggest you know, fault. I and yeah, it. Although probably most of the time, mm-hmm. yeah, it is true. It's a lot of times just the situations that you're putting the dog in. Whether you're going too fast, whether you're asking too much, mm-hmm. whether you're yeah. To me, the biggest thing is is the flipping the coin and being like, well, let's just see how this how this goes. When you you don't even have the dog controlled on lead yet, yep. you know, and it's just kind of that gradual thing. It's it's a slow. And oftentimes painful process, but that's also what makes the end of that ride so much sweeter because when you finally do have that dog that is under control, doing everything you want them to do, you know that that was a teamwork. You put that work into that dog. You and the dog did that together to get to that point. Yeah, 100%. And especially over in Scotland, 99% of the shooting dogs is in, are in for obedience. That's pretty much what they're all in for. Mm-hmm. you know. And if they just covered it young, it would be sorted by then, but... That's probably what the biggest deal is. Mm-hmm. That's what I would take for the weekend and say to everyone that's the number one rule. Mm-hmm. But good. Well, we uh, we're gonna wrap things up here because uh, we have some things. We're gonna go try to catch uh, Lewis a, a muskie. Musky. A musky. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, we're gonna go uh, do that here this evening. Uh, but uh, I'm man, I'm already looking forward to next year's event. Yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah, just hope the weather's a bit cooler. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> the weather was hot, but like I said. I'd rather have the hot than the rain, mm. at least the thunderstorms, because we can't do anything in the storms, but yeah. at least we could. Like Everybody did such a good job managing their dog in the heat. I mean, now we did everything we could. Like We had huge water tanks and, and pressurized hoses, and like we had a lot of things you know, going on to keep the dogs cool, but I thought everyone did a really good job. But um, for everyone that was at that Strike Force event, I cannot tell you how proud I am you know, to be a part of this community because it was just an incredible group of people, incredible gr- group of, you know, we can talk about the dogs certainly, but it was the people that made that thing, you know, just the quality of people, the genuine authenticity that y'all came with and how how genuine you were in cheering for each other and wanting each other to succeed. I've never been around anything like this in, in the dog community. And it is a truly special thing that I'm, I'm very proud of. So, um, you know, keep it up. I can't wait for next year. Keep going with your strike teams, keep training it. Uh, it'll be, it'll be here before you know, it, but season will be here also before you know it. So, uh, and if you want to get involved in any of this, uh, this stuff, all it takes is, uh, being a retriever roadmap member, go to www.retrieverroadmap.com and you can become a member and become, uh, you know, a part of everything that we have going on. If it sounds like what we're talking about interests you. So, uh, Lewis, thank you so much yep. for uh, for the trip and for spending time with us here today. Yeah, and just thank everyone to Retrieve Roadmap at the event. And everyone was so welcoming and I had an absolutely fabulous time. And I hope everyone took something away with them. And uh, yeah, get training. I'll yeah. maybe hopefully see you next year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and that too, I guess, if you guys are interested in uh, what Lewis is talking about and interested in his, uh, his training styles and techniques, that too, it just takes uh, that Retriever of my membership to get in there and see those uh, that content. So uh, we're going to go try to catch a muskie, but I uh, hope everybody else has a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll talk with you all soon. So thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Leave us a review on iTunes, and a special thank you to Yukonuba because without them, we couldn't do what we do here, bringing this information to you.